I sat down in my seat for The Little Mermaid, wondering whether this was really the best life I could be living. The answer, of course, was no. So I left again for a couple of very large drinks. The answer remained no, but that's what booze is for, right? To face the unfaceable, to tolerate the intolerable, to shag the unshaggable and put off all regrets until the inevitable visit to the clinic many days later. That is the point at which you ask soberly, Oh God, what have I done? And the nurse looks at you with that devastating combination of pity and disgust on her face that says, Yeah, what have you done? Well, what I've done is I've gone to see The Little Mermaid, which gives rise to possibly the only point of agreement with the film that will emerge from this review. I accepted the charge, the terms, the conditions, the no-refund policy, the ID check for my booze. We don't need to see his identification. And in doing so, I have given and repeated my affirmative consent, meaning the cinema and the studio and the writers responsible for this violation of a script are immune from legal ramifications. This is precisely the approach 2023's The Little Mermaid champions in all arrangements where the words fuck me are likely to be uttered. So here we are, about to roast a mermaid. Now, I present to you The Little Mermaid 2023. I'll say at the outset that I've never been a particularly big fan of The Little Mermaid, because I've never been a 12-year-old girl, and I've always been a bit perplexed by its undoubted popularity, because science has yet to explain the minds of 12-year-old girls in ways men and sane people with taste can understand. I do quite like Hans Christian Andersen's original fairy tale. Ariel committing suicide at the close resonates much more with me today, having now seen this film, than it has ever done before. Much like J.M. Barry's Peter Pan, Andersen's story came from a time when men were real men and women were real women, and small fairy creatures from Alpha Centauri did not march at the front of pride parades. The 1953 Peter Pan adaptation found Disney in its delightfully sensible mode, and so, though relatively shallow next to Barry's original, it did capture most of the essential beats. The difference between boys and girls, the aspiration of girls to maturity and motherhood, the desirability and pitfalls of eternal youth, the importance of growing into memory and responsibility. 1989's The Little Mermaid, by contrast, didn't really feel bound by conventions like depth of meaning and interpretation, ironically enough for something set so very deep beneath the oceans. Though it holds up pretty well next to anything Disney puts out in the modern era, and certainly next to The Little Mermaid of today, the 1989 film falls much further short of its literary progenitor than the 53 adaptation of Peter Pan did. It had, and has, much less to say. As the acknowledged first of Disney's animated offerings to meet success, despite it being, or perhaps because it was, marketed as a girl's film, movies, like The Vote, are for women too, after all. It has rather less to say to boys. Its lessons, its insights, its characters, everything about it save its catchy tunes are much less universalist for the fact. The Little Mermaid 2023 has caused a couple of what we might euphemistically call broader cultural discussions, by which I mean it caused a lot of idiots to shout at each other about race. But for my part, I would wager the male-female divide as being by far the most interesting of the story's lessons. The 1989 film was known at the time to be a girl's film first and foremost, and if archetypes can be formed as recently as 1989, then Ariel and her story are the archetypes, or perhaps the prototypes, of modern female-centric storytelling. Her hankering after a boy in the 89 film led some reviewers at the time to observe the film might not prove popular with the women's liberationists of his day, and it's true to this day that several of the worst takes about that film come from the descendants of that movement. Think the actresses who boast that they'll never let their young girls watch the film because of its perceived reduction of women to simplistic boy-obsessed beauty objects, or laughable concerns about the film's depictions of consent and the lack thereof both of which prove the timeless truth that the only people more stupid than standard political activists are politically activist actors. We'll touch on that a little bit more later, because the 2023 film's attempts to update the kissing sequence for modern sensibilities wreck the film in unintentionally comic ways, to the surprise of nobody who watches modern movies. That update is at least a difference, but a huge amount remains the same across the two films. The Little Mermaid is a pretty handy contrast between Tales for Boys and Tales for Girls, because it demonstrates a difference in trope. But as broadly as possible, the nature of conflict and growth differs between boys and girls' films. I am, of course, speaking in generalities, there are plenty of anecdotal exceptions that represent the best and the most universally appealing stories around. But generally speaking, tales for boys represent daunting challenges that require the acquisition of strength, skill, and will to overcome. Your basic war story is a conflict of visions between the oppressed and the oppressor, 
and the oppressed must grow to overcome the oppressor. The basic psychology at play is domineering. The want to be free of imposition so often amounts to the desire to impose your alternative. The boy hero is knocked back because he is inadequate. He trains and he learns, he crosses from inadequacy to adequacy and then to supremacy, and he wins. The girl hero, by contrast, and as well represented by the Little Mermaid, often remains static. Themes of oppression and imposition remain, but they must be outlasted more than overcome, outlasted because they represent a natural injustice that is bested by forbearance. The girl doesn't need to change because she's already right, the world just doesn't recognize it yet, but it will eventually because the triumph of right is inevitable. Victory doesn't amount to besting and replacing an enemy, upending a society, taking down an evil empire or overcoming a supervillain. That is boy hero telos, social domination. While the girl hero's telos is social acclamation. The boy views the world as an object and the girl is the object of the world. Ariel is a brilliant example of this type because she does try to change herself in a bid to win the boy. She does exercise agency and attempt to engineer change, but the moral lesson is that she shouldn't and ultimately she didn't need to. The only reason she did was an external imposition by her father. What she needed was social acceptance of her wants and of her nature and acclamation for its consequences, which are just natural to her. Her moral lesson is that she's lovely and beautiful and right. The moral development is on the part of her father, who learns that she's lovely and beautiful and right and accepts that he must let her go, to be herself. Swapping a tail for a set of legs doesn't actually represent change in the story, it represents a static moral rightness. Don't bend, don't break, stay strong, you go girl. Ariel is not, though, a Mary Sue in the 1989 version, because she isn't all-powerful, she isn't super strong, the central dilemma arises from her profoundly mistaken attempts to rectify her father's mistaken approach to parenthood. But she is, in her essence, perfectly right. The essential difference is that the boy wants improvement through change, while the girl wants the freedom to be entirely herself. Ironically, it was felt at the time that the 1989 film wouldn't appeal to feminists, at least in part, for the agency Ariel displays in making that mistake. Because one of the paradoxes of modern feminism as it manifests itself in girl boss characters today is that it has an incredibly restrictive and ultimately meaningless and content-free idea of what girls are and should be. Girls should have motive and agency, they say. Ah, but, but not like that. And we'll be seeing a lot of that as we move on to the 2023 remake. But it wants saying that the 89 film also shares a lot of the traits we commonly scoff at when we look at modern girl stories generally. Hans Christian Andersen's original is a brilliant contrast because it shows a middle ground between tales for boys and tales for girls that doesn't lapse into the cliches and navel gazing that both genres so often fall for, and we'll probably touch on that again later as well. But the sublime can wait, for we have many fathoms of shit to wade through first, and it's probably about time to get on with it. Just one final word at the outset, we commonly refer to this genre of Disney film as a live action remake. I'm pretty sure I've done it myself in the past. It's not, though. I mean, just look at this shit. She's riding a blue gimp in a blue room, surrounded by blue gimps and a plastic model of a crab. You can call it many things, but live action it ain't. So if you catch me in this script referring to it as a live action film, feel free to pillory me in the comments because I would be wrong to call it so. The Little Mermaid 2023 opens with pretty ocean visuals that give me nightmarish avatar flashbacks with a quote from Hans Christian Andersen floating on the screen that the writers presumably found on Goodreads or Brainy Quote because there's no evidence they've actually read him. Much as with the 89 film, we begin on a ship, though on this occasion the crew is attempting to harpoon a mermaid. They know of mermaids, you see, and the mermaids know of them. The film occasionally threatens to flesh out a geopolitical relationship, but since that would require a consistent application of the brain, they never really get far with it. The shipmates reference the Sea King, and the dangers of mermaids and how the mer people have made the seas dangerous, especially at this time of year when the king is gathering his family to him. Why? How do they know this? Not sure, probably won't ever be. The animated film sees the sailors evince a superstitious belief in mer people, as you would expect, given its folkloric origins. King Triton? Why, ruler of the mer people, lad. Thought every good sailor knew about him.
But that belief is understood to be a superstition, and it's rubbished by the supposedly more enlightened types like Grimsby, who encourages Prince Eric to disregard the myth-making. people, Eric, pay no attention to this nautical nonsense. But it ain't nonsense, it's the truth. While the film only threatens to do geopolitics between the humans and the people, it does put a bit of work in when it comes to the human society, though always in strange and vaguely nonsensical ways. Grimsby is here, as he is in the 89 film, but rather than the wry and stern advisor and guardian of Prince Eric, here he is the prime minister of some fictitious and, as far as I recall, never named Caribbean island queendom. It has no king, but it does have a queen, with whom Grimsby seems to be in some sort of hopefully sexless relationship. Prince Eric, for his part, is prince by adoption. The film seems rather unclear on the point, but it seems he was adopted by the royal family when a shipwreck killed his biological parents, though the king who adopted him is also dead, meaning the very occasional references Eric makes to his father bear qualifications that are seldom forthcoming. When either Grimsby or Eric talk of Eric's father and of what he would have wanted from him, are they referencing the dead king who adopted him, or the dead father whom we don't even know if he ever knew? Happily though, those questions are largely irrelevant because the plot doesn't actually need any of this muddling garbage. It's pretty much entirely pointless, it goes nowhere. Eric will once or twice say something like, I wasn't born into this life and I'm not that comfortable with it, but he's reliably interrupted, and so it makes no difference at all. His parentage does mirror Ariel's, but this reimagining incorporates bits and pieces of sequels to the 89 film that I genuinely didn't know were a thing before doing the research for this video. I'm not surprised they exist, but neither am I surprised that no one I know has ever mentioned them. They tended to be part of that miserable straight-to-video genre of small bucks money spinning from that romantic era where streaming services didn't yet exist. Borrowing from 2008's The Little Mermaid, Ariel's Beginning, Ariel's mother in this film, Queen Athena, was killed long ago in a run-in with humans. This mirrors in the broadest sense Eric's own personal history, but plays out strangely in its particulars. You might think, for example, that having grown up knowing your mother had been offed by the landlubbers, you'd have an inbuilt prejudice against them. Everyone else in this film has that prejudice. The humans vaguely hate the merpeople, and the merpeople more concretely hate the humans, but Ariel alone does not, despite having a far more obvious and personal reason to do so. The Disney fandom wiki actually sums up this weirdness without realizing quite how weird it is, and I quote, Her father Triton, ruler of the Ocean Kingdom of Atlantica has forbidden merpeople from visiting the surface world after Ariel's mother Queen Athena died and was killed by a human. Ariel finds solace in the human object she finds, with support from her friends, Flounder, a sergeant major, and Scuttle, the gannet. Um, she, she finds solace… what? Her mother was killed by a human. She finds solace in the human object she finds? That's like Anakin collecting Tusken Raider memorabilia and falling for a Tusken woman. I mean, who thinks like this? She should want to kill them all, not just the men, but the women and the children too. Since this film will go on to pervert the love story between she and Eric, there was an opportunity here for them to shake things up in more interesting ways. Have her save Eric from the storm in a fit of unexamined and unexpected empathy that she then has to struggle with. Have him pine after her, but have her be much more hostile at first and conflicted later, essentially invert the original dynamic. He has to prove himself to her and overcome her inbuilt antipathy toward the humans who killed her mother. Ariel, the complex character morally torn between attraction and memory, Eric, the relatively lowly and desperate lovesick boy who has to earn her affection. But because that would be a much more interesting reimagining, the film simply doesn't think it worth acknowledging the character consequences of its own new setup, and it proceeds to ignore them entirely for the majority of the film. By the way, I'm not writing a hagiography of the 89 film here. There's actually a lot more potential in a tragic backstory than the one given in that film, where the merpeople's hatred of the humans isn't really formed or fleshed out at all. King Triton refers to them as evil harpooning fish eaters and such. Do you think I want to see my youngest daughter snared by some fish eaters hook? And the difference isn't really anything more complicated than that they're, well, different. But if you are going to build something more nuanced than that, you do need to account for the consequences of your setup and this film never does. The ship sequence plays out similarly to the animated film, the principal difference is being a. the sailor's knowledge of the merpeople, b. Grimsby's role and also his character and history, and c. which is smaller but I'd argue quite significant, its deployment of symbolism. Eric and Grimsby contrive to drop a telescope in this version of the opening, 
and it's this falling object that occasions our scene transition to the underwater world, serving the function of the fork and the pipe and other collectibles in the 89 film. I'll touch on those in a moment, but of the telescope, in the 89 film, voiceless Ariel stays with Eric in the castle after he rescues her and she attempts to get him to fall in love with her and almost succeeds. But she's hampered because he remembers vaguely his rescuer, a mystery girl, singing to him on the beach after dragging him from his storm-wrecked ship. He has it in his head that she is the dream girl, the one, and to the extent he hesitates in falling for Ariel, he does so because he holds out hope of finding this mystery savior, not knowing that they're the same person because Ariel cannot speak to affirm it. There's a moment at the beginning of the third act and immediately preceding Ursula's corrupting arrival where he's prepared to give up on that forlorn search and settle with Ariel. We see him on a cliff at night playing a flute to the sea. He sighs, he looks to the window of Ariel's room, he stands, he throws the flute into the sea, symbolic I think of his decision to give up on the doomed hunt for the fantasy mystery girl. That doesn't happen in this film. There is no flute sequence, and it might sound like a small thing, but it's appropriately symbolic itself, representative of the 2023 film's lack of subtlety and symbolic understanding. It casts away an object, a telescope, that's got significant symbolic potential for no other reason than to manufacture a scene transition. There are plenty more offensive changes and plenty worse decisions made, but this kind of thing bugs me because a great many significant errors are born from the mindset that treats important things as trinkets. If not a flute, couldn't this telescope have stayed with him as the symbol of his doomed search for the fantasy girl? Couldn't he have discarded it in a more meaningful way, like he discards the flute in the 89 film? It would only have taken a few seconds, and god knows the film could shed 50 times as much bloat to accommodate it, but that would require some sort of imagination, so… so no, I guess. It's just a scene transition, boring and mechanical and convenient. Another change from the original is the reason Ariel's absence is noted at home. In 89, Sebastian is putting on a concert for King Triton, and Ariel, who is due to sing, doesn't turn up. She's too busy pining after princes and gawking at humans. Very simplistic stuff, uncomplicated but important and easy to grasp. In 2023, King Triton is called to something called a Coral Moon Meeting, where all his daughters gather to bring him tidings. Is that a pun? I think that's a pun. From the Seven Seas. He has seven daughters, one for each of the seas, which doesn't matter in the slightest except insofar as it lets the film flaunt its multicultural credentials. None of these multiracial beauties is a character, none has any role to speak of in the plot, their presence does, however, pose questions of those who do. King Triton, for example. The film pretends, when it wants to, that Ariel's mother's death is important in determining what passes for the world's geopolitics. It forgets it completely when Ariel is desirous of humanity, but it also forgets it with the multicultural sisters. Either the death of Triton's wife was so massively important that it turned him into a submarine racist, or it didn't matter much and he went shagging mermaids in all the seven seas. You can't easily have that both ways, can you? Either he's embittered to the point of xenophobia by the loss of his wife, or he's a mer player. Which is it, film? By the way, you could have made them impactful to the story. Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale has it that they are not allowed to visit the surface until they reach the age of 15, and each of them is born one year apart. The Little Mermaid is the youngest of six, so she has the longest time to wait. The promise made is that each of the sisters visits the surface when they are of age and brings back stories, tales of what they saw and the wonders of the world above the sea. The Little Mermaid is portrayed as most fascinated by these tales, but she'll have to make do with her grandmother's account until her eldest sister makes the journey, and then the tales of the five sisters in turn, which are never sufficient. Though it's also worth mentioning that as they grow and become familiar with the world above the sea, each of the sisters becomes disenchanted by it. They eventually come home, leaving home to be more beautiful than the surface world after all, making them less romantic and so conveying less romance and less satisfaction to the youngest daughter who still yearns after the sky. There are plenty more details to the original that impart nuance lacking from the 89 film and certainly from this one. As a rite of passage, for example, the girls must have oysters affixed to their tails before they make the upward journey and this is painful. But when she complains, the Little Mermaid's grandmother informs her that pride must suffer pain, which sets up her ultimate sacrifice at the close of the tale. But the most pertinent bit is the role of the sisters. Because the Little Mermaid is forbidden from reaching the surface, they are her only source of inspiration. Her passion and her desires and her inquisitiveness are all the stronger because she only has partial, second and third hand accounts of the wonders above her. While in both 1989 and 2023, she frequently breaks the rules and visits the surface of her own accord. 
which pretty well ensures the sisters play no substantive role in either film. Ariel's infatuation with the above generally, and the humans and the prince specifically, result from her own initiative in both films, which diminishes both next to their literary origin. If she does this all the time, why does her wonder persist undimmed? Shouldn't it diminish with familiarity? Isn't her instant infatuation better explained by a first encounter with a legend than it is by a long and gradual glimpse through her own eyes of the world she so desires? We get here our first introduction to Sebastian and Flounder, and both demonstrate the follies with these pseudo-live-action reimaginings. Most if not all of the Disney animated classics could have been live-action originally, and in many cases, a conscious decision was made, sometimes by Walt Disney himself, to make them animated instead, and Sebastian and Flounder are good evidence as to the reasoning behind that decision. In the 1989 film, they are both very expressive, Sebastian in particular. Their voice parts are well performed, but they're augmented by the kind of accentuated, anthropomorphized expression that gives them a physical character and personality. The problem with making them look as close as possible to an actual crab and an actual fish is that you can't do that. Flounder in particular is entirely unexpressive in this film, because he's a fish, and fish faces don't really do emotion much, like at all. Sebastian's enlarged eyes give him slightly more of a physical identity, but the emphasis there is on slightly. While the voice actors do their best, and by do their best, I mean they seem to be deliberately trying to sound as much like the original cast as possible, they are entirely unaided by anything in the visual realm. That makes them much less memorable, and in Flounder's case almost entirely forgettable. I'm adding bits and pieces to this script two hours after I left the theatre, and already I've forgotten what he actually looks like in the film. I have to go back and find him again to remind me that, oh yeah, he, he's just a generic fish. Give me either of their names in this context, and my mind will immediately conjure the animated versions of the characters, because by making them animated, Disney made them, if not more human, then at least more recognisable. You're forced to wonder what, if anything, crosses the creative minds of the people now working at the studio, on the generous assumption they have creative minds at all. What is it about this pseudo-live-action medium that exceeds the creative potential of animation? You're already animating 95% of the shot anyway. I'm not a huge fan of the replacement of hand-drawn with computer-generated animation elsewhere in Disney's domain, but at least films like Frozen have the ability to accentuate and exaggerate and bring more out of their characters than this pseudo-live-action style can. So why is pseudo-live-action the current meta, Disney? What's the point? What are you achieving artistically? What about this is better than about this? Ariel, of whom more in due course, finds the discarded telescope from earlier and goes exploring a shipwreck, which is pretty much unchanged next to the 89 equivalent, save for being longer, a persistent fault with the film. The shark attack, for example, drags on well beyond need. It's much more action-packed, it features a random Jurassic Park reference of all things, as Ariel deploys the kitchen mirror trick to escape. But all of this feels rather like it's missing the point. Disney in 89 didn't feel the need to drag out spectacular action sequences to keep the audience's attention. The shark sequence is there to play off her fascination with human trinkets and to display her bravery and her recklessness and her foolhardiness in pursuit of them, character traits that inform her later acquiescence to Ursula's bargain. The action part of that was entirely circumstantial and took up only as much time as was strictly required, but here, action seems to be the point in and of itself, or at least the labourer point that could be, and was, made much more succinctly in the earlier version. And yes, yes, I'm aware, I'm aware of the irony of a guy who does multi-hour video essays complaining about brevity. I know, just, you know, let it slide. Having escaped the shark, the film continues to match the original in form if not in quality. Scuttle arrives, and we get a perfunctory redoing of the fork and pipe sequence from the 89 film. This film, though, doesn't really find any joy in all of this. 89 was quite charming in the way it lets Scuttle, who's otherwise a buffoon, enjoy this one moment of intellectual superiority. What? What is it? It's a dingle hopper. He doesn't actually have a clue what these human objects do, but Ariel doesn't either, and Scuttle bluffs his way to make believe virtue by imparting knowledge she doesn't possess. It's a little thing, but it's a nice and charming thing, and it's an imaginative thing. It portrays Scuttle's lack of brains, but love of stories and prestige, and it portrays Ariel's childish fascination with the unknown, her willingness to believe, a character she'd otherwise have no conceivable use for or attachment to. The 2023 film, by contrast, truncates it. There's no pipe here, for example, 
because, I don't know, smoking is bad, I guess, which means there's no payoff joke later as she tries to play music from it and ends up covering Grimsby with Ash, which doesn't just deny the audience a joke, but also two bits of color character as well. Ariel's willingness to try and her desire to impress, her bemusement and embarrassment, her fear of failing, Grimsby's essential stoicism and detachment. In this version, we just get the fork, and to my knowledge, we don't even get the hairbrushing payoff from that either, which occurs in the same scene as the pipe incident in the 89 film. They were never ruffle moments, but they were charming and characterful, and I'd rather have seen them than not. And they're not replaced by anything better, which is the only real reason for doing away with them to begin with. Speaking of Scuttle, there's a bit of character weirdness going on with his, now her, introduction, as she swoops down and grabs a fish to eat immediately before alighting before Ariel and Flounder, who is, notably himself, a fish. But this doesn't seem at all bizarre to them, or threatening, or scary, or disgusting. The 89 film skirts around the realities of nature, as many such films do, is what allows these disparate creatures to be friends, and is what clearly delineates good people from bad. Recall Triton castigating humanity for eating fish, and the shark's distinction is one of the few threatening sea creatures in the tale. The 89 film even has a little musical number with a French chef preparing a fish meal while Sebastian watches horrified. The 2023 film will shortly introduce Ursula and signal her villainy by having her eat a squealing shrimp, so it does grasp the basic idea of this when it wants to, but when Scuttle swoops down and snatches up a fish for a snack, this is… what, not a moral event? I mean, the simple solution is, hey, how about you just not do that. It's, it's irrelevant, it's unnecessary, it didn't need to be there. You could have saved yourself a problem there, film. Anyway, on to Ursula, I guess, whose intro in this film isn't dissimilar to her 89 entrance, commenting periodically on events as they unfold and setting out her nefarious plans. Though I get the sense that it's more strictly expository in this one. Otherwise, her principal difference at this stage is her backstory, for here, she is King Triton's sister, and so Ariel's aunt, and the reason for this change is, well, um, it's it's a change. I mean, it doesn't actually achieve anything, it doesn't impact the plot. I suppose it's nominally simpler, maybe, but not beneficially so. Here she's jealous of Triton and wants to usurp him and rule the seas, I think. While in 89, she wants to usurp him and turn the merpeople into seaweed for her gardens. If you want to stretch a point, you could say her evil in this version is proximate, vaguely even political, while in 89 she was more preternatural and even spiritual, the representative of a spiritual evil. That's the kind of unalloyed evil Disney's been shying away from in recent years. See as evidence all the weird villain origin stories that keep popping up in a bit to make the likes of Cruella de Vil seem somehow sympathetic to us. But this film doesn't even try that. It doesn't really try anything. It introduces a minor complication by changing this backstory without bothering to consider altering the effects on plot or on character, making it unnecessary information. Occam's Razor is pretty good for writing, as it is for argumentation and philosophy. If you don't need to complicate it, don't. Back in… um… oh fuck, I've actually forgotten where they live. Atlantis? Talacan? Back in the watery wherever, Triton scolds Ariel for being absent during the meaningless coral moon ceremony thing from earlier. He does make an obligatory reference to Ariel's strength of will and character during their argument. Here he remembers that yes, she had a mother, from whence she gets her headstrong nature. Having remembered about it, because otherwise these two would have virtually nothing to say to each other, the conversation ends and the film proceeds to forget all about it again. We get a rendition of Part of Your World following this tete a tete, and I suppose now might be the time to address the question of Ariel herself, since the titular character is so deeply fascinating that we've got this far into the review without talking about her at all. I know some people have been very mean about her appearance, such as estimating the cost of an Uber trip between her eyes, but to me, that is, um, that, um, that's just, yeah, that's just really very wide of the mark, guys. If you're the kind of person who goes in for cheap jibes like that, then I'm, I'm afraid there's just a vast gulf between us. A distance so great it can never be crossed, a gap so wide. No, no, obviously I jest. All jokes are at someone's expense. There's a reason I'm a cartoon. I happen to think I keep calling her Haley Bailey, so fuck it, that's what we'll go with. I happen to think Haley Bailey is very pretty indeed. But whatever that's worth, coming from someone with my proclivities, Relevantly for this review, however, she is a much better singer than she is an actress, in that she can sing and seems very rarely to act. We can fault the direction here, we can fault the writing to a degree, 
Though given whole chunks of the film are lifted straight from the 89 version and cartoon Ariel acted them perfectly well, I think that defense is probably limited. We can likewise blame the fact she put in such intensive work learning to swim and do stunts in a film that ultimately ended up relying more on wire work and CGI than underwater acrobatics, which you can tell from the way none of the characters ever actually look as though they're under the water. We can blame a combination of all of these things if we like, but we can also blame the actress because she doesn't ever seem to do any acting. The singing is mostly splendid, in terms of its technique, if not always in its sound mixing. If you compare, say, Part of Your World from 1989 to 2023, there seems to have been an emphasis on maximalism. Everything is bigger and bolder and louder, which affords her the chance to show her skills, but not necessarily her understanding. It's a common foible in modern music, and again especially with modern female singers, too heavily influenced by the likes of Beyonce and not enough by, for example, Eva Cassidy. The poet Seamus Heaney drew a distinction between craft and technique that I always find useful in explaining the difference between essentially hitting the right pitch and hitting the right mood. Craft, he said, is what you learn from other verse. Craft is the skill of making. In this case, Haley Bailey's craft is pretty much spot on. Right now. That's a lovely, lovely voice. Technique, by contrast, is, to use Heaney's words, not only a poet's way with words, his management of meter, rhythm, and verbal texture, it involves also a definition of his stance towards life, a definition of his own reality. Poets, of course, have a tendency to arrive at definitions via circuitous means, but applying the technique distinction to Bailey's performance in this film, her striving after craft perfection results, if anything, in a too perfect rendition of these classics. Too heavy a focus on craft leads to needless complications that say, listen to me, rather than, listen to what I'm singing. Wish I could be. They're not overly present in the earliest part of your world, they do sneak in later on in the film, allied with a slight over-reliance on belting, which is a technique really meant to convey power and not a huge amount else and you get a more soulless version compared to the original. Soulless precisely because it strives for too much soul as a genre. Probably the clearest example to demonstrate this point, it's clearer because it's worse than Bailey's performance, I should add, is Rita Ora's recent butchering of Running Up That Hill. I butchered it myself months ago on my second channel, link in the description if you fancy a cringe. Everything about these musical performances strives for bigness, for grandness. A more conventionally powerful rendition that sacrifices nuance, flaws, and subtlety for perfection, and so, paradoxically, results in a less perfect performance. The orchestral accompaniments seem altogether bigger as well, but they have then to be separated and dimmed and pushed further back to avoid overpowering the singer and to allow her to come to the fore, which makes for a colder and less natural mix than the 89 versions. Polish often works against charm and heart in singing. You can have too much of it. But this probably does constitute a nitpick. She is a good singer. You can tell she's a good singer because the autotune is seldom audible in her songs, unlike certain other characters, but we'll come to his tragedy in a moment. There's also the inevitable question of casting with Ariel, and it's tedious, but it is commonly raised. The short form answer is that the show makes its quotas painfully transparent but there are plenty more and more relevant and interesting reasons to criticize it. The longer form answer is that people on the right who criticize diverse casting per se kind of prove their opponents' points and vice versa. I won't be accused of taking a light touch on the recasting issue. I've criticized race-focused casting at length in previous videos. There's a whole mini essay devoted to it in my Last Rings of Power video. And yes, I do plan on completing that series at some point. Stop asking, please, now. But I don't buy arguments against cultural appropriation whether from the left or from the right. Except where it harms world building and character, as it does with Ariel Sisters for the reasons previously explained, casting a black actor in an historically white role or a white actor in an historically black role is not necessarily an issue. You can make an argument that casting Ariel as black in this film damages the film because the world building doesn't make sense of it. You can likewise point out that Hayley Bailey just isn't a good actress to begin with. But to those who will inevitably pop up in my comments saying that black actors shouldn't play the role because it originated as a Scandinavian fairy tale with a white character and that can never change, I reply thusly. No. I've not spent all my critically aware life repudiating the left's arguments against cultural appropriation, only to accept the equivalent argument from the right. 
Culture as we know it in the West is appropriation. That's a good thing. Cultural appropriation is a form of cultural transmission and is the reason we have all of these stories to begin with. Cultures which allow and which are receptive to transmission are cultures that grow and become strong and rich. Cultures which are incapable of transmission or which reject it ossify and stagnate and die. The reason we have iconic stories like Aladdin to stick within Disney's realm is that white westerners saw the beauty in the Thousand and One Nights and sought to adapt and translate the tales. To say Ariel is a Scandi folk tale and black people shouldn't play the role is to say Aladdin is a Middle Eastern tale and whitey shouldn't be allowed to adapt or adopt it. That is not to say that black people should be cast because they are black any more than that white people should be cast because they are white. It is not to excuse studios from evincing a race preference in one direction at the expense of the other. But the correct grounds to criticize Ariel's casting in this film is that it was designed to be to quota or to make a political point, and as a result the character does not fit the world. It is not that having a black actress in the role is wrong because of her race. Because there is no conceivable way the Little Mermaid could ever be black. If you make the latter argument, the argument that the tale is Scandi so blacks can't play it, then you basically agree with the premise of the other side's race politics, you just disagree with the direction it takes. Why, for that matter, should Americans be adapting old Scandi folk tales themselves? Scandi immigrants helped found the country, sure, but so did freed black slaves. If a character's race is important because race qua race is important, you have accepted the left's proposition. They believe that, that's why these quotas exist to begin with. Equally, if you're on the left and you believe black representation is important, at the expense of art, you can't then complain when white folk meet you on your own terms and demand representation in turn. That one extreme replicates the worst features of the opposite extreme is depressingly predictable. Feminism breeds manonism, black power breeds white power, gay pride breeds straight pride, etc. ad nauseum. I'll happily appropriate Shakespeare, who happily appropriated Arabian cultural trappings in saying a plague on both your houses. The only relevance race has in art is art itself. Does it make sense in universe or does it not? Does the fictional world make sense or doesn't it? Is the actor good or aren't they? And that's it. The answer to all three in this context is no, and that is the proper grounds to criticize the casting decisions. But there is nothing, absolutely nothing, intrinsically wrong with casting Ariel as black. You simply have to A, cast for talent, and B, to make the resulting depiction fit the world. If you set it in Scandinavia, logic entails the character be white. If you relocate it to the Caribbean, logic dictates they need not be. Anyway, moving on to non-racial matters, the film sticks quite closely to its 89 progenitor as Ariel pops up to the surface to reenact the ship encounter, which features few deviations. It's night, there are fireworks, there's a statue to Prince Eric, there's a dog. Ariel hoists herself up on the bows to watch the humans dance and sing. Eric makes an abortive attempt to explore the effects of his altered backstory on his dreams and aspirations. I'm very uncomfortable with privilege, etc., for no adequately explored reason. But he's interrupted by the storm. Ariel's reaction to the peril her human performers meet is suitably alien, but I'm not entirely convinced that's deliberate. She seems almost fascinated by their frantic running around, securing the ship against the wind and the waves, and if it is deliberate, then that is a good way of portraying her essential otherness. The humans here are reacting to something that is very familiar to her, so she finds their reactions to the familiar beguiling. The reason I'm not sure it was deliberate is that, as mentioned, Hayley Bailey doesn't really do acting at all, so it could be that she's fully aware of and empathetic with the humans' fears and plight, she's just not expressing her emotions because Bailey can't. So besides being wrecked by a storm and heading for the rocks, the ship also explodes. While everyone else abandons it, Eric bravely stays behind to rescue a dog that goes on to serve no meaningful role in the plot whatsoever, but hey, at least it shows us how courageous he is. What's that you say? A white man? Being courageous? Well then, by the standards of most of the reviewers, I guess that means I now have to love the film, despite its flaws, because representation is more important than art. Ariel rescues Eric, brings him to the beach, sings to him, as is proper to the 89 film, but which invites another comparison with the fairy tale. In Hans Christian Andersen's telling, she rescues him, she leaves him on the beach, she doesn't sing to him. She watches from afar as he wakes up in the company of the girls who've come down from a nearby temple, but he has no memory of his rescue. He doesn't know that she exists. Again, it pays forward to the main difference between literature and film, and the reason the latter is cheaper than the former. Anderson's tale is one of removed and unrequited love, but not just love for the human. It's a tale of self-sacrifice, it's a tale of lusting after souls. 
and its message is that there are higher rewards than love and happy relationships. The Little Mermaid loves a man who doesn't know she exists, always from afar, and the nobility of her love is precisely that she never gets the boy. But we will come to the close of that story at the end. Of the 2023 film, we get the same dramatic, romantic, triumphant yearning shot from the 89 film as Ariel rises from the rock at the end of Part of Your World. But this seems just lazy, badly shot next to the animated version, the camera isn't low enough, she doesn't have as much elevation. And this shot pretty well sums up the tonal difference between the two. This one is just less colourful, less soulful. It's a less feeling version of the film that spawned it. It still mirrors the basic structure of the original. We cut away to Ursula at this point, drawing her plans against Ariel and Triton. And credit where it's due, Melissa McCarthy is not as shit in this role as I thought she would be. She's captured Pat Carroll's voice from the original pretty well. She actually excels in her singing performance later on. Compare that with David Diggs' turn as Sebastian in the rendition of Under the Sea that follows. As mentioned, these pseudo-live caricatures suffer for a lack of physical expression. That places a lot more importance in the voice acting. And in his spoken parts, Diggs isn't terrible, which is to say he's only a little bit flatter than Samuel Wright was in the original. But it's the singing that accentuates the difference in quality. The lovely Altiori cottoned done to this back when the last trailers were released, so I'll let her explain the issue here. What do they got? A lot of sand? We got a hot pedestrian band! Looking for under the sea, under the sea. What the music say? You got a kiss the girl. Say you gotta kiss and what is clear more than anything, especially when you hold the two side by side, is that this <laughs> lacks any trace of emotion or passion that was fully present in the previous, or should I say the legitimate version. And the wonderful Vex Electronica, who's recently launched her own channel, picked up on something that I completely missed about the accompanying visuals. Disney animated classics have the freedom to animate scenes that perfectly match the lyrics, thus giving the songs not only more weight, but more impact as now we have a sense-based memory to tie it all together. This rendition was so poorly orchestrated, I genuinely wanted to cry in the theater. They up the color visually compared to the rest of the movie, but what we see on screen doesn't match up with any of the lyrics. And as a result, you end up experiencing a complete disconnect. For example, the verse where Sebastian sings, the newt play the flute, the carp play the harp, the place play the bass and the sounding sharp, the bass play the brass, the chub play the tub, the fluke is the duke of soul. This has no visual lineup to make the purpose of the song hit even harder for not only Ariel but for the audience. Links to both videos are in the description. The only thing I'd add to that is that I'm surprised they didn't change the down where it's where to take it from me line, given the film's fondness for affirmative consent. Shouldn't Sebastian need Ariel's permission? Shouldn't she have to say yes please every 10 seconds until his crabby completion? Actually, no, that's not the only thing I'll add. In the 23 version, Under the Sea is a duet between Sebastian and Ariel. Which is another example of the modern egoism that undermines so much popular music. The song is supposed to be Sebastian's argument to Ariel about the merits of home. He's trying to convince her and to dissuade her from leaving, as she so desperately wants to. The 89 version has him accompanied by various constituents of the underwater realm. He's singing about the loveliness of home, and home is singing with him. Having Ariel duet with him in 23 rather defeats the object. It gives Hayley Bailey another chance to flaunt her vocal cords, but this is just superficial musicality. The performance is overly trilly anyway, emphasizing talent over euphony again, but more importantly, it makes her a participant in an argument that's being made to her. That could have been made to work if you show that she's coming to accept Sebastian's case, though you'd then have had a hard job justifying the whiplash later. As it is though, no, she's not being convinced by him, she's just singing with him because… because… she… because yeah. Back on land, we're introduced to the diverse queen of this amorphous human island nation, and she and Grimsby make bizarre and abortive attempts at injecting some sort of land versus ocean geopolitic. Queen Ramonda here says that the Sea King, Triton, is reclaiming their land and disrupting trade and making shipping dangerous. Which leads me to think, hmm, a Caribbean island trading between Europe and the Americas in, what, the 17, 1800s? Wonder what they could possibly be transporting on those ships. Prince Eric gets one of the film's new songs, and as mentioned, this is properly tragic stuff. Now all I am is haunted as days and hours roll by. All I ever think about is you. Jesus! 
They got Alan Menken back to do the songs for this film, alongside Lin-Manuel Miranda because, of course, that seems to be a universal rule at this point. Are there musical numbers in your film? Then Miranda must be on the team, it's in the contract. The tragedy of this song isn't really the lyrics, though they do miss Howard Ashman's poison nuance, it's not in the accompaniment even, but it's definitely found in the singing and the performance. Jonah Howard King has the requisite background of a Disney prince, educated at Eton and Cambridge, which doesn't make me jealous at all, but he doesn't have the decency to be quite so attractive or talented as they, and he is categorically not a singer, nor indeed is he much of a performer. The autotune is so strong in sections of his little ditty, Wild Enchanted Waters, that you could be forgiven for thinking he was duetting with Daft Punk, except that the song isn't very good so you know he isn't, and his performance accompanying the lyrics is so overwrought you find yourself wishing you were watching Mamma Mia instead, which is about the least enviable position any sane person of good taste can find himself in. And I did say the lyrics weren't the source of the tragedy, though it is worth pointing out their banality next to so many of the original songs. The real issue is with the song's recourse to visual imagery. You'll recall that the point of the rescue sequence in both this and the 89 film is that Eric remembers Ariel's voice and not what she looked like, yet while Enchanted Waters spends most of its time yearning for something he hasn't actually seen. Lines like, The night you rescued me silhouetted by the rising dawn, and When your eyes outshine the horizon line, outnumber references to the one thing about her he even half remembers, which is her voice. And no, it's not a huge issue, not least because it's sung so badly you actively try not to pay attention. And yes, you can reason your way to saying that this is romantic imagined imagery on his part, but it still smacks of lazy lyricism. The phrase horizon line is itself lazy. It's redundant at best in its own sentence. The horizon typically is a line, by definition, and it seldom shines, making outshines a truism. It's only there because the word shoreline appears two lines later, but horizon line doesn't actually rhyme with shoreline. It simply repeats, which is, once again, lazy writing. There's also no real point to the song. Eric was never really a character in the original film, because the original film was designed for young girls, and young girls' ideas about boys are really just acquisitional. The irony in being lectured to about feminists about objectification is that women objectify at least as much as men do. But the 2023 film doesn't really do much to flesh out Eric's character anyway, making this song from his perspective just super erogatory, or at least wasted potential. His role in the plot is still as an object of desire, rather than a fully fleshed out character, and unless you're going to go all the way and rectify that, there's no point making half the journey. Cut the song, save our ears, save the time, get the fuck on with it, film. At this point, we're what, an hour in? And we go back under the water for an argument between Ariel and Triton, backed up by her sisters, about the climate and the general health of the ocean. Ariel rejects the suggestion that humans are dangerous and suffers through a perfunctory lesson on the damage humans allegedly do to coral reefs of all things, which kind of sums up Hollywood's fashionable attitudes and the delay before opinions are received, much like the Paul Ehrlich population bomb style fears that still inform the politically green set's belief in overpopulation, despite having been roundly debunked by history decades ago, we stopped hearing about coral bleaching and such in the news of late, because inconveniently for activists, it turns out nature is more resilient than we thought. The annoying thing about these pseudo-environmentalist messages is, well, besides their euphoric catastrophizing and the way political activists latch onto them to peddle their 19th century ideologies, it's the fact they distract from real and worthwhile conservationist causes. If you are going to inject environmentalism into films, can't you at least make it useful? The Little Mermaid doesn't, mercifully, think it worthwhile adumbrating some systemic analysis of humanity's planet rape, and instead it decides that the mer people are especially pissed off because their coral reefs are being destroyed by shipwrecks, which is kind of funny, really. A, because the odds of a ship sinking on a reef are really quite small, and B, because we actually sink ships deliberately in real life to encourage re-coralization, if that's a word. Coral reefs like growing on shit. The mer people should be thanking humanity for giving them so many reef-building wrecks. It's almost as if these writers haven't read any of the literature underpinning their vague fashionable opinions, but no, that would be a shocking revelation. That can't be it. And all of this is taking the place of the 89 film Ariel's much more obvious pining after Prince Eric, because if anything, this film wants to underplay this aspect of her character, and this poses issues, as when Triton asks Sebastian whether he's noticed Ariel being abnormally distant and distracted of late, Sebastian says no, and really we have no reason to disagree. 
She was absent from the Coral Moon meeting earlier, but this hasn't been reinforced by her underlying wants anything like so strongly as the 89 film did. We haven't been shown her being increasingly distracted, we've been shown her absence once from proceedings at the beginning, but for a film that's taking so much longer to hit every essential beat, it's really kind of remarkable that it not only fails to match the original's content, it actually conveys less content in that time. This argument between Ariel and her father again recalls her mother's fate, her death at the hands of humans, which only re-emphasizes the point already made. There's no reason for their difference in opinion on this matter. Triton gets mad and destroys Ariel's room full of human trinkets, but we are left wondering why the fuck she gathered them to begin with. Ursula seizes the post-argument haze to tempt Ariel down into her nether regions I now, I now really regret that choice of words, and once again, comical ineptitude is on display. Though not so much from Melissa McCarthy herself, to whom we'll come shortly. In the first place, Ariel's journey to Ursula's underworld should positively terrify her. One of the first things she sees en route is the complete skeleton of a dead merman. And if that weren't enough, she then gets attacked by the fauna. And if that weren't enough, she has to swim through a literal tunnel of fucking skulls to reach her nefarious aunt. And you might well be thinking, hey, th this isn't really tempting, is it? I mean, this ought to scare the shit out of her. This is put as mildly as possible, off-putting? Surely Ariel will at least raise the question, say, auntie dear, I know you're pretending to be my friend, but you sure seem to have killed a lot of people. That tunnel full of skulls is a bit weird. Not really sure I should trust you. In the event, what does she say? You're not at all like my father described you. And she means this positively. As in, Ursula doesn't seem to be as evil as Trident made her out to be. Based on what film? She uses skulls as fucking wallpaper. And the film can't even remember its own setup here. Ursula asks Ariel what Triton said about her. Ariel responds, and I quote, that you like to cause trouble between humans and mer people. That, that's an actual line in the film. That's the thing that Ariel remembers, having just swum through a tunnel of skulls. Say, remember how in the preceding scene, Triton trashed Ariel's room full of human trinkets and said humans are horrible and evil because humans killed her mother and deserve to be destroyed? You would think causing trouble between humans and mer people would be a point in Ursula's favor based on everything the film has said so far. If you defined trouble so broadly as to include she likes tricking mer people into falling in love with humans, then it might be sustainable. But you would then be doing an awful lot of work on the part of the writers because that is not in the film. It wasn't an issue in the original because these lines weren't in the original. 23's The Little Mermaid has taken the decidedly weird approach of dropping random objects on the original script without actually concatenating them into the resulting film. One of the characters could randomly shout out Wakanda forever and it would make as much sense as any other addition to this story. The temptation aspect of the original film works because you know Ursula is dark and sinister, but you don't yet know the extent of her evil. It's a sup with the devil and use a long spoon situation. You comprehend the basic devilness of the person on the other end, but you don't really know what it entails, or what it means precisely, or what it has planned. And the moment you do, it's too late. Ursula is dark, nefarious, evil in a vague and unsubstantiated way, but the vagueness allows for temptation. Ariel knows she probably shouldn't be doing this, but she's prepared to strike the bargain because she cannot conceive of the cost. That's undermined when you have Ursula's lair carpeted with a genocide's worth of skulls and festooned with the corpses of merpeople. There's nothing about this darkness that can lure Ariel in, everything about it should make her run a mile. To be fair to the film though, Melissa McCarthy is, and I never thought I'd find myself saying this, one of the film's stronger components. Her acting is never much more than mid in her speaking parts, but she's one of only two on-screen actors who even reach those heights. It's her voice that carries the performance, both spoken and sung. In terms of a purely vocal performance, this version of Poor Unfortunate Souls really isn't terrible. It doesn't break any new ground, and McCarthy's triumph is in doing a more than passable impression of Pat Carroll. Despite the singing being altogether quite good, however, the two principal issues arise when she's warbling. In the first place, the physical performance just isn't there. You can tell she's miming and that the audio has been overlaid in post, which isn't unexpected, but it does require some finessing to make sure mouth movements match sounds and sounds match the actor's physicality. I sing a fair bit, it's the reason I'm hoarse today, I just had a lesson before recording this script. 
Usually I sing like a girl and I'm not even joking. And one of the key lessons you learn, especially for belting and other powerful techniques that live in your chest, is the link between the physical and the audible. You can try it at home. Go to call out to someone far away, but pause just before you do it. Note what you're doing. Mouth open, palate raised, teeth are probably showing, mouth almost smiling compared to your usual embouchure. You are prepared to make this sound. You don't have to be aware of the technical elements to spot their results. Put your TV on mute and watch someone shouting. You know they're shouting, whether or not you hear the sound, because everything about their face conveys the shout. McCarthy, alas, does not. In fact, what mid-tier acting she's capable of during her spoken parts seems to disappear entirely while she's performing the song. Watch her face as she flies around the screen, and you're struck with expressions that are seldom more than vacant and disinvested. It's not just the song that stands out in the 89 film, it's also Ursula's physicality, her expressive range, her non-verbal character. That stuff is sadly missing from McCarthy's performance. The other issue is, of course, the changes to the lyrics. Most of the song remains the same, but an entire section on body language has been excised. Having laid out the terms of the deal to Ariel, legs in exchange for voice, and found her doubtful, the original Ursula ups the trickery, telling Ariel that men on land don't value women for their voice. Never underestimate the importance of body language, Ursula says. The men up there don't like a lot of blabber. They think a girl who gossips is a bore, she sings. Come on, they're not all that impressed with conversation. True gentlemen avoid it where they can. But they dote and swoon and fawn on a lady who's withdrawn. It's she who holds her tongue who gets a man. That verse is entirely gone from the 23 version, expunged, wiped out of the song. Mencken himself explained that the lyrics had to be changed because, and I quote, they might make young girls somehow feel that they shouldn't speak out of turn. And this is just so fucking asinine. If the 23 film feels soulless, it's in part because everything it does is designed to be ultra safe, even to the point of denuding characters of spice and of wit. Mencken has no excuse not to know this, Ursula is a villain. She is tricking Ariel. The sentient audience knows that's what's happening, because Ursula has already told us that's what's happening, twice by this point in the film. You are supposed to hear that line and think, no, Ariel, don't fall for that. But you're also supposed to think, quietly to yourself, but I can kind of see why she might, because that's quite a spicy line. Spicy because its characterization of men is not completely unfair. The line is partly satirical. It's a veiled barb against a part of its real-world audience. A barb that stings more sharply than the blathering equivalent of modern feminism, that stings with all the sharpness of a brick. And so, as in this scene, misses its target completely. You don't even have to agree that Ursula's slight contains a degree of truth to it, to recognize that it's more potent as an attack and more appealing as a line in its own right than the nothingness that has here replaced it. Young girls somehow feeling that they shouldn't speak out of turn is the point of the trick, Jolly Green Jizz face. The moral resolution is in Ariel realizing that she doesn't have to give up her voice to be accepted and loved. That message actually remains in this film. We'll encounter it toward the end, but here it's not going to refute anything. It's not disproving or rebuking Ursula. It's not even subtly rebuking men in the real world anymore. There was no reason to remove this line. There was every reason to keep it. The payoff remains. The setup is gone. That's just shit writing overall. There's another slight change to this scene in its setup that precedes a major and hilariously bad one. The slight change is that in the 89 film, having accepted the devil's bargain and lost her tail, Ariel has to be helped to the surface by Sebastian and Flounder because she's never had legs before and she doesn't know how to use them, so she can't swim on her own. Her stumbling around on the beach later on just reinforces the point, while in this version, Ariel swims herself back to the surface without issue, kicking merrily away like she's been training on legs for several years. That, though, is a minor peeve. There is a much bigger change that goes on to wreck a substantial portion of what follows. The old familiar bargain is, give me your voice and I will give you legs. You can go to the surface. You have three days to make Eric fall in love with you, to be sealed by a kiss before sunset on the third day. In this version, Ursula throws a little spanner in the works. Secretly, and unbeknownst to Ariel, she alters the spell. In this telling, all that proceeds remains, with the additional complication, Ariel won't remember that she needs and wants a kiss. And every time she's reminded, she will instantly forget it again. You, um, you don't even have to think about this to understand that it's an appalling decision. In the first place, the point about the devil's bargain is that it is, 
well, a bargain. The devil exploits your naivety, as Ursula does Ariel in the original. The lie is one of a mission. Here is your task in plain terms. I can give you the task in plain terms because you have not considered the proposal fully. I have anticipated difficulties that you have not foreseen. It's a subtler form of dishonesty than simply lying or secretly changing the terms of the bargain. If Ursula is capable of altering the spell to doom Ariel's task, why even bother with the bargain to begin with? Why not just take her tail and her voice and have done with it? And it also removes important aspects of Ariel's character as well. In the 89 film, the simple loss of her voice forces her to compensate by showing other sides of herself. We see her scheming to get the kiss and being rebuffed. We see her innovating, trying again, only to fail. We see her conveying infatuation, guile, disappointment, frustration, love and hope, all without saying a word, because she knows what her goal is and she's a bright young thing and she will do everything in her considerable power to get the kiss that she so badly wants. By contrast, having her forget that she needs and wants Eric to kiss her means she no longer has any incentive to show any of these aspects to her character and her personality, and so, naturally, she shows none of them. It probably makes for a less cringe-making performance, because Hayley Bailey cannot act and couldn't have captured a tenth of her animated ancestors' physical charm and dexterity. But on a story level, it leaves you asking, just what the fuck are you doing? Why should I give a shit now? What am I learning about Ariel? What is she going to show me that I don't already know about her? And the answer to all of these questions is, nothing. There's no point. Her character doesn't develop again from this point to the end of the film. She is done. This was almost certainly chosen because these absolute brainlit writers didn't like the idea of the little mermaid, the little fucking mermaid of all characters, fawning over some man, which is just hilarious. Of all the Disney characters, the one character who cannot possibly say or convey, I don't need no man, is Ariel. It's pretty much her entire reason for being. Without a man, she has no business striking a deal with Ursula. Without a man, any such bargain can only lead to her doom. She does need a man, mechanically. It's vital to the plot. But the writers seem to think that this detracts from her character and her agency as a strong and independent woman. Because these writers are idiots. The clever aspect of Ariel's character in 89 is that, for all her goals are simple and conventional, she knows what she wants and she is the one who leads the story, who pursues the goal, who tries everything to achieve it, the one who shows great flexibility and ingenuity in the attempt. It's what makes her, ironically enough, a strong, independent woman. And by removing that, in the name of feminism and freedom, these writers have turned her into a ditzy, forgetful girl who has no initiative, because she has literally forgotten what she wants, and so she makes no concerted attempt to achieve it. Ain't progress wonderful? Having risen to the surface, she's then rescued by a fisherman and taken through a village, which is really just an excuse for another new song, which in turn, according to the director himself, is an excuse for a travel montage. Even Rocky had one, I guess. But not only is this not productive, it is counterproductive. In the first place, it goes some way toward explaining why the film is almost an hour longer than its predecessor while adding nothing of substance. In the second place, it muddles the sacrifice of Ariel's voice. She will not infrequently narrate in song between now and the time she gets her voice back, which might be forgivable were she to make any meaningful observations, she doesn't of course, but which would still work against the dramatic realization of her muteness. I sat in the cinema, listening to her after she'd lost her voice, thinking, well, what the fuck was the point in taking her voice away from her if she's not going to shut the fuck up? The montage simply longs out what the original accomplished more efficiently, her re-meeting with Eric. And if I'm complaining about a lack of brevity, you know things are pretty fucking bad. The travel montage through the colorful village also serves to highlight the film's weird relationship with geography. The 89 film kept this as vague as possible in a bid to universalize the story and avoid getting bogged down in particulars, because if you start getting bogged down about your world, you invite questions that need answers. We're told that this weird little island nation, which is a monarchy led by a black queen with an adopted white prince son advised by a Pakistani prime minister, that it trades with Europe and also with Brazil, which means I am forced to point out that one of the largest trades between Europe and Brazil in this time period was slaves. The Empire of Brazil imported around half of all slaves taken from Africa to the New World, and continued doing so until the British Navy imposed a military blockade to end the trade. The very diverse population of the Little Mermaid's island kingdom could, in a charitable interpretation, be freed slaves, or in a less charitable interpretation, they've all been given a rare day off from the plantation 
in order to dress colorfully and bang steel drums because, you know, stereotypes are racist, except where they aren't. And it's not as though I'm looking especially hard for these geographic connotations. The film isn't shy about placing itself in time or place. We'll even get a map sequence later where Prince Eric points to various countries on a map and explains geography to Ariel. The film seems to want to replace the mutual fawning and lovesickness of the original with a more organically developing relationship, which completely misses the point, but oh well, I guess. Ariel is reintroduced to Eric in the castle, which I guess is where you take all random civilians you rescue from the sea, and we don't get an especially ebullient reaction from either of them. Ariel because she's forgotten who he is, and Eric because he doesn't know who she is. You have to forgive the incongruity of this arrangement in the original as well, but at least you're invited to do that, because it's a harm the story of star-crossed lovers and fate makes accommodations for such little things. But in this version, the same basic mechanic is in play, but in service of a completely countervailing motive. The writers seem to want to portray a naturally forming affection between the two, rather than something powerful bought in at first meeting. But as is so often the case, it carelessly plonks the new idea on an old script and doesn't do anything to make it fit. Ariel cannot speak, and except where we're made to suffer her internal monologue through song, she is forced to try and converse with body language. She doesn't convey much at all for the reasons previously explained, but what little she does try to convey seems far too much for Haley Bailey to muster. Eric isn't especially disappointed by her inability to speak, which is more a crushing realization in the 89 film. He sympathizes and says most people around here use too many words and have nothing to say. Which is kind of ironic, since Prince Eric says this in a speech that is not in the original, that goes on to talk about, among other things, fossilized sea stones, him guiding her around a plot convenient museum of items, and it achieves very little in double the time. There is something of an inversion here as well. In the 89 film, Ariel attempts to impress Eric by using the false knowledge given her by Scuttle to use human objects, combing her hair with a fork blowing a smoking pipe like a musical instrument and covering Grimsby with ash, and so on. In this film's museum though, it's Ariel who shows Eric what various of these undersea collectibles do, which does accomplish something, the film is making a bad attempt, but an attempt nonetheless, to create a more naturally and mutually forming relationship than the directed simping of the 89 film. This scene does a good enough job of establishing a shared interest and more particularly, of making Ariel interesting to Eric. It's just a shame that the scene has taken the place of one of the original film's funnier and more charming little skits, and without really changing the result. The destiny of both films is for these two characters to grow closer together anyway. The principal difference is one of intent. Another key change between the two films is in the impression of time. Both establish the three-day ticking clock mechanic, but while the 89 film proceeds at quite a pace, and manages to make the ticking clock really tick, drumming up a bit more tension as we see Ariel get ever more desperate at her voicelessness, this film does the precise opposite. The first film condenses three days into what feels like a few minutes, while this one drags the three days out to feel like, well, yeah, three days. It's a nigh on interminable film, and that's largely a result of having Ariel forget her reason for being here. The need for a kiss and her desperate need and even existential want to get one keeps the 89 film motoring along and is never out of the audience's mind. But here, because Ariel forgets it, it serves no purpose. It adds no real sense of urgency, because our protagonist is not aware of the urgency of her situation to begin with. On top of which, because the film is trying to have the relationship form naturally, it has to take the time out to manufacture situations that allow them to learn more about each other. Again, not necessarily a bad thing, except that it just doesn't work for this story or in this film. Here, there is no French chef so no rendition of Le Poisson. I assume this was to avoid pissing off the French with a crude stereotype, because it's been a while since the French blew up and tried to conquer Europe in a fit of pique, and they are probably overdue another attempt. But then, if this was about avoiding stereotypes, how do we explain all the happy diverse villagers on this weird little island who smile and dance and play kettle drums every hour of every day? This is all part of the film's dating sequence, which returns to more familiar grounds as Eric and Ariel go out onto the Blue Lagoon. Which brings us on to Kiss the Girl, laughably undermined by a combination of a lyric alteration and by Ariel's established forgetfulness. For a couple of lines have been inserted into the song, meaning Sebastian's injunction to kiss the girl make a gesture toward fanatical bores who push for affirmative consent in all romantic relations. Use your words, boy, and ask her, Sebastian says. But as is so often the case, this new invention hasn't actually been made to match the scene over which it's been superimposed. Eric doesn't use his words and ask her at all. Ariel, of course, 
forgets that she wants to be kissed. She forgets it every time they come close. It's Eric who's simping in this version, not her. So whenever he leans in to kiss her, she forgets that that's what she wants and she leans away from him. Which far from expressing affirmative consent, she can't because she can't speak, it seems to suggest tacit rejection. Yet Sebastian carries on singing Kiss the Girl, which I think means by the bizarre logic of the film that Sebastian is perpetuating rape culture. It's clunky, it's awkward, and it didn't need to be this way. In the original, it's Ariel who makes the moves, and Sebastian's song is intended to aid her concerted attempt to be kissed. If anything, the person not giving or being asked for affirmative consent is Eric in the original, yet I don't recall anyone ever complaining about that. But having Ariel fully aware of her desires and the instigator in the kissing game would have completely solved the problem the film is here trying to tackle, if you even consider it a problem. I rather think the affirmative consent movement is absolutely fucking ridiculous. You can't and don't sign formal contracts for intimate interactions, and there's a vast gulf between going with it and going way too far. Not every misinterpreted sign or overly forward advance constitutes sexual assault or harassment, and the presumption that assent is an issue that needs to be solved in this way is based on typically skewed data around assaults, but that's all by the by. Via a quick cutaway to King Triton, who begins to blame himself for Ariel's disappearance, she and Eric return to the castle and Eric begins to explain that he wasn't born into privilege and he isn't comfortable with it. But as with every single instance where this little character quirk is addressed, or introduced, it's interrupted, and so it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere at all throughout the film, and seems a decidedly lazy attempt to stick a sheaf of character on the original's minimalistic depiction, but no actual content or depth. Again, I'm by no means opposed to giving Eric more of a character, I think it would be a good thing. But you do actually have to do something with it, you have to complete the job. More lines do not necessarily mean more character. The vague idea that his life mirrors Ariel's is definitely present, and I'm sure that's what the writers were going for, but the result is no different from the 89 film, and that achieved all of this more efficiently. So you have to ask why are you even bothering with this? They part then, as in the 89 film, Eric resigns himself to never meeting his fantasy rescuer, which means less in this film because he's not been defined by falling after her, and he makes to return to Ariel only for Ursula to appear in disguise and trick him, which is all much of a sameness. Once more, as with the original, it's Scuttle who learns of this, and that Eric is to marry Ursula, and it's his job to convey the tragic news to Ariel. But the manner of his delivery is, um, well, it's, uh, it's rather different. He raps. My money don't jiggle jiggle, it folds, I'd like to see you wiggle wiggle, for sure. You not heard that scuttle back? No, the gossip, the buzz. Remember the swamp? Remember my song in the swamp when I was like, wham, kick your wham. Because Lin-Manuel Miranda is involved, so of course he does. And just, just fucking, no, I mean, don't get me wrong, the rhythm is impressive, the word use is slick, sometimes it's quick-witted, but, I mean, no, just no. It's genre-breaking, it just, it doesn't belong in the film, in this setting, in this time period, it does not belong in the mouth of the character who delivers it. I, I mean, I'm cringing just thinking about it, I mean, I've played you a bit of it already, but here, I will read you a few of the lines without inflection. Hey, wake up, wake up, wake up. What? Hey, have you not heard the scuttlebutt? Your butt? No, the gossip, the buzz. The who said what, who does that, yeah, the scuttlebutt. Well, I was flying over land and sea, an ear to the ground, then I came flying here for you to see and hear what I found. Remember the swamp? Remember my song in the swamp when I was like, womp, chicka, womp, womp, chicka, womp, womp? I remember. Well, ever since, the what's his name, the guy with the hair and the shirt, the prince, yeah, the prince, has been dropping hints. He wants to, you know, when humans dress all nice like they're penguins, throw rice for the pigeons. They're trying to blow up the pigeons, but those are just urban legends. I know a lot of really fat pigeons. Scuttle, I, will you just listen, Sebastian, I got the scuttle, but hurry up. You'll be like, what? When I drop the scuttlebutt? Okay, now huddle up, buttercup. From the woman who wash all the clothes, to the hunter who arrows the bows, the chatter all over the palace is that your Prince Eric is gonna propose. What? The somebody nobody knows. They're saying he suddenly chose. Who? Who? You sound like an owl. 
I bet it's the kid with a new set of toes. No. Oh yes, anything goes. Who'd ever guess? Our little Ariel's marriage material. Time for the rice and the dress and the what do you call it? The thing with the lips when they press. I don't have lips. I have a beak. So I guess I could give you a peck on the cheek. I think, um, I think that's probably about enough. You get the picture. Now just imagine that, but delivered in an incredibly cringy rap manner. And you, yeah, you've got the, um, you've got the picture as he says. So, um, yeah, Scuttle raps the news that sexy Ursula has turned up and Eric is to get married, which seems rather to recreate the problem the film made an abortive attempt to solve by giving Eric a backstory, because he's actually no more of a character in this. He's no less a depersonalized object than he was in the original, which, as is so often the case in girl stories, was alien to the thoughts of men. Unless, of course, those thoughts were about the heroine. This film isn't so dissimilar to the original in this respect, a classic teenage girl's myopia, I want the boy and dad won't let me. Screw dad. I want the boy. The boy loves me. Oh no, an attractive stranger. I'm losing the boy. Lol, attractive stranger gets mobbed and bullied by animals and torn to shreds and no one helps her because she's a bitch. Yay, the boy loves me. I win. There's really not a huge amount that diverges between this penultimate sequence and that of the original film. Eric seems slightly less sure he's making the right decision, but that only throws up a host of problems resulting from the botched setup and the partial implementation of character and a diminution of the symbolism of Ariel's voice. It's the voice, you see, that symbolizes her, which is the tragedy of her loss of it, the threat of Ursula's possession of it, and the triumph of Ariel's regaining it. This film seems to want to muddy this up a bit by having Eric doubt the possessor of the voice, I assume in a bit to prove that Ariel has value beyond the beauty of her voice. But that's thoroughly balked, not least because, at the very close of the film, the voice will come to symbolize Ariel's full personhood again, as Triton sends her off with the words to the effect of, you shouldn't have had to lose your voice to be heard. The wedding scuffle has the added complication of a wedding ring, where previously the seashell, the voice, and the kiss were basically it. This film seems to think that the ring, symbolizing marriage, will fulfill Ursula's win criteria, rather than a mere kiss. This is never made clear, nobody in the film has explained it or seems at all aware of it right up until the moment the writers decide that everyone, and I mean everyone, knows and understands the stakes. Scuttle dive bombs sexy Ursula and knocks the ring away, rather than the voice shell which he thought was more important. The ring lands on the floor and fucking Grimsby of all people, who has absolutely no part in the backstory or any knowledge of the bargain, kicks the ring away. Which from his perspective is motivated by what exactly? Being a dick? I mean, from whence did his bitchy dislike of sexy Ursula arise? The film seems to think he's in on the story, but as best I could make out, no, he's not at all. So, so what the fuck is going on here, film? Ariel eventually retrieves the shell and gets her voice back, which for reasons that don't exist, so I'll not try and explain them, means she remembers now that she has to kiss Eric. But because she spent so long fannying about the sun goes down, her tail comes back, Ursula kidnaps her and whisks her away, which prompts Queenie, who just occasionally pops up in the plot, to remind us she exists, but never for long enough to tell us why, to observe that all of this proves the sea gods are evil and men and mer people cannot get on. Remember this because she will forget it shortly. Triton appears to rescue Ariel, who attempts to escape, only to be captured again by Ursula's electric eels, and it's impossible to tell whether she's supposed to be being tortured here because Haley Bailey cannot act. Speak up, girl, because what you say matters. I think the implication is yes, she is being tortured. We see the electrical sparks and Triton voluntarily gives up his trident to save her. This means the same eels that were just now vaguely tickling Ariel grab him and zap him into dust which poses at least a few questions. I mean, are we to assume the only reason they couldn't have done this at any time is that Triton's trident confers him immortality or immunity from damage? Maybe, I guess. But then Ursula is about to be stabbed by a boat and the trident doesn't protect her from that. But then, does anyone care? No, I don't think we do. Eric dives down at this moment to distract Ursula, who at least solves the problem of the eel's power levels by accidentally exploding them with the trident, which enrages her and Melissa McCarthy assumes her Melissa McCracken form, growing even larger and more tentacly and recreating the final battle from the 89 film, Whirlpool and all. Now, you will recall that to the extent we know anything at all about Eric is that he's an explorer. He loves exploring, he's a sailor, he's very good at sailing, he knows his way around a ship, spends a lot of time on them. Mm. Imagine the fear of knowing you have a gay man on board a boat. When you retire at night, you think to yourself, God, 
Will I wake up and find everybody dead? To the extent we know anything at all about Ariel, it's that the human world is alien to her. It's the source of her fascination. She's bemused and perplexed and titillated by it, because she really doesn't know anything about it. This bare-bones but nevertheless solid and uncomplicated characterization is what dictates the battle's resolution. In the 89 film, Ursula traps Ariel in a whirlpool and tries to zap her with the trident, but brave Eric boards a shipwreck and steers it through the storm so that its prow stabs Ursula and she dies. Basic, simple stuff. Set up, pay off. Brave Eric rescues Ariel, just as Ariel once rescued him. Evil bitch queen is vanquished, they sail off and live happily ever after. The end. That is almost what happens in this film. But for no reason beyond its current year, the roles are reversed. Brave Eric, noted sailor, is the one trapped by Ursula. Though Ursula really doesn't give a shit about him and has no reason to be focusing her efforts on his destruction. Ariel, in her mermaid form, who has never been on a ship, never mind piloted one, and who has no legs at this point, flops her way across the desk of the floating wreck then drop on the deck and, flop like a fish. and she steers it through the storm to stab Melissa McCracken. You fucking go, girl. And no, it's still not over. Ursula's death and her loss of the trident sees King Triton return to life. Ariel informs him that Eric helped in the fight against Ursula, which I suppose is just about true. Triton tells her to come home. Eric, meanwhile, swims quite possibly several miles back to shore where, like poetry, Queenie tells him that merpeople and humans were never meant to be together. Under the sea, Sebastian persuades Triton to let Ariel go, and in a shot-for-shot -shot redoing of the original, he uses his trident to disappear her tail and give her her legs back. He doesn't seek affirmative consent to do this, mind, but oh well. She returns to Eric, there's another song, they kiss, they get married, and Queenie, who just finished telling us that their worlds were never meant to be together, bids the now-married couple a fond farewell, marking a new and entirely unearned chapter in interspecies relations. Perhaps the strongest scene in the film is reserved for the very end, as Triton stops their boat as they make for the ship that'll carry them off and bids Ariel goodbye. He admits he was wrong, that he's heartbroken to see her go, but he'll welcome her on her return. He gives that line about not having to lose your voice to be heard, even though the film itself is kind of hazy on this point, and he speeds them on their way. The humans and the merpeople who were never meant to be together and who've hated and distrusted each other for all of history until precisely this moment gather to wave the ship off. And that's the end. Finally, at long last, we made it. I genuinely don't know the last time I saw a remake that made so many glaring changes with the net effect being at best no change whatsoever. There are ostensibly significant alterations to world building and character in this film compared to the 89 original, but I can't think of a single way in which they actually impact the plot, largely because the changes have been superimposed on rather than embedded in the story itself. Ariel's mother being killed by humans doesn't register at all on Ariel's character and her infatuation with humans. King Triton is salty about it, but he was salty about it in the original, without this additional motive, resulting in no change. Prince Eric is adopted by a queen whose husband died at sea. This doesn't register at all on his attitude to the sea generally, or Ariel in particular. The mirroring parental misfortunes are used to explain an ever-present antipathy between the humans and the merpeople that A is not well substantiated or consistent, because it doesn't seem to have bled into the populations at large, and B is only filling a gap opened by this film to begin with, by having the humans aware of the merpeople at the start. That's an awful lot of work, and an awful lot more time expended to simply recreate what the original established with less, Ursula is Triton's sister this time. So, so what? What does that change? Nothing, as far as I can tell. Ursula tweaks the bargain with Ariel to induce her amnesia, something that doesn't impact the overall tale, and that only makes the intervening character beats appear confused and half-formed, the film not really grappling with what that should mean or why it should be. Supposedly, this places a greater emphasis on naturalism in the bond that forms between Ariel and Eric, which the actress herself seems to think gives Ariel more freedom. But again, it doesn't change the story one jot, and if anything it deprives Ariel of agency and ingenuity in the pursuit of this nebulous idea of womanly freedom. She still wants the prince, she still gets the prince, rather than working for and earning his affection though, it is fortuitously bestowed upon her. The plot mirrors the original in every particular, it deviates only to elongate and diminish its force. The flaws mirror the original in every particular as well, with a few more thrown in for good measure. A huge amount of additional confusion is generated by this pursuit of nebulous and ill-defined freedom, achieved as mentioned at the ironic expense of agency. 
Girl strains against the trictures of her father. Girl is frustrated at being held back and stunted in her development, takes matters unwisely into her own hands, rectifies that mechanical mistake, and earns the much more important recognition from her father, and from society at large, that she was right to begin with. Beautiful, smart, blossoming inevitably into maturity with her eyes on the object of a man. She gains the object by her forbearance, without changing, and the acclamation she deserved from the off. So in short, the story was always a shallow one, because that's a description of the 89 film as well, but it's been made shallower and stretched out beyond means or need in 2023. The latter is a problem generic to modern Disney remakes, the former was an issue even back in the 80s. So I think then this might be my excuse to close with a contrast. In Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, the prince never sees the Little Mermaid. Her love is always not only unrequited, but in every way one-sided. She goes to extreme measures in her pursuit of personal fulfillment and suffers immense pain in the doing of it. The attaching of clams to her tail is a mark of passage, the walking on glass shards pain that is the trade-off for being given her legs by the sea witch. But she is not just in love with the prince generally. Her story cannot be satisfied in the generic Disney princess gets the prince form, because she's in love not just with the handsome boy, but with the dream of humanity itself, the experiences she cannot know, the life she cannot have, and in particular, the eternal soul that is uniquely man's gift. Mermaids don't have them. When they die, they turn into sea foam and they disappear into the ether, and that's it. Man, who lives a shorter life on earth, lives eternally after death. The bargain she strikes with the sea witch is not just made in pursuit of love, but in pursuit of a soul. The beauty she's conferred, her voice is traded for the ability not only to walk on land, but to dance as no human could possibly dance, comes at the cost of great and unending pain. She meets the prince, who loves to see her dance, not knowing that dancing causes her agony. And she dances for him because she loves him, and because she loves his soul. But he never falls in love with her. He believes he can only marry the woman he loves, and the woman he loves is the woman from the temple who he believes rescued him from the sea. He meets her again, they get married, and it breaks Ariel's heart. She left home for him, she danced for him, she suffered for him, and all of it was for nothing. She believes she'll die, only for the sea witch to propose another bargain. The Little Mermaid sisters bring her a dagger that they gained from the sea witch in trade for their hair and so a large part of their own beauty. They are prepared to sacrifice to bring Ariel home. The terms of the bargain are that if Ariel stabs the prince, and lets his blood touch her feet, she'll regain her tail and be able to return home to live out her life as a mermaid. But she doesn't do it. She can't kill him. She is prepared to die eternally rather than have him die, though she knows what that entails, because she has no soul, so she won't live on. There can't be a happily ever after for her. It's her life or his, and she chooses his. However, she doesn't die. Because she sought a soul, and yet she was prepared to sacrifice that search and herself for the soul of another, she's lifted up among others who distinguish themselves by this same moral selflessness and purity. She's not given a soul as a reward, but she is given the chance to earn one. If she does good deeds for mankind for 300 years, she will ascend to heaven in the end, and that is how the fairy tale closes. Keep in mind, that's a story intended for children. Hans Christian Andersen did suspect at the time, and wrote to this effect, that children might not grasp the fullness of it, but he hoped their parents might. And after all, who is going to be reading to the children to begin with? There are a couple of things to note about that. Perhaps the most important is that it stands as a refutation to those, and I know they'll be in my comment section already, who will dismiss criticism of quote-unquote kids' movies because they are just kids' movies. No, fuck off. Children are too important to be left to shitty media. This was once fairly well understood. The anti-woke crowd still do understand this when they complain about nefarious agendas being pushed to children in media. You shouldn't just be concerned that your children be shielded from politics you don't like. You should want more for them, more than safety from the negative. If children can be negatively impacted by what they consume, they can be positively changed as well. Secondly, and relatedly, it harks back to the problem I raised at the beginning, which I raised specifically in relation to girl stories but which does infect certain boy stories as well, albeit in different ways. One of the reasons I dislike the 89 film is precisely that it is a girl's film. Which isn't to say stories shouldn't appeal to girls, but rather that playing on girls' cheap wants and shallow emotionalism denies them, as well as boys, stories that teach them things they don't already know. I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. I'm right, you're wrong. Kids' films generally do have this problem, because they can appeal to children directly. 
parents don't need to interpret or to explain and inform around the story the child consumes, assuming a story exists to begin with, which frequently they don't. In fact, in too many instances, parents are able to use film and other visual media as an excuse not to do this sort of thing. They can turn children over to mass media to satisfy the basis need for their entertainment. And sure, I understand why. You're busy. You have your own life. You don't have the time you wish you had. But so were people back when the fairy tale was written. They had harder lives than you. Denying children relatively complex stories with complex meanings and messages precludes the possibility that they will ask you or search these questions up on their own time to try and unweave the magic that captured their imaginations to begin with. Disney's first The Little Mermaid is disappointing because it falls so far short of its source material in its depth, in its interpretive scope, in its potential to educate and encourage thought and introspection, its ability to aim for a higher life and meaning. It goes without saying that the 2023 film fails all the harder. The 89 film is entertaining, it has catchy songs, it's vaguely uplifting in all the ways the 23 film isn't. And yeah, I guess if you're comparing it to now, that's a start. But comparing it to the fairy tale, that's still a huge drop off. Is it really the best we can do? Why is it the stories we tell children today have to be so much shallower than the stories we told children a century ago? Can we just perhaps do better? And with that, I'll let you go. Thank you for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.